If you brought a Bible with you, open to Proverbs 4, verse 18, and I'm just going to give you a couple verses. This won't be real long right here, but I do want to share this with you. Proverbs 4 and verse 18. This has been our, our uh, theme. Just keep playing, Matt. It's fine. You look so comfortable standing there <clears throat> for two hours on a Sunday. <laughs> uh, this has been our, our theme uh, passage uh, all year, all year so far. And it simply just says that the path of the just is like the shining sun that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. The, the path of those who are right before God. How many are thankful that we are made right before God through our faith in what Jesus has done? We're made the righteousness of God in Him. So there's a path that the Lord has for us, and that path, Scripture says, is to get brighter and brighter unto the full light of day. So we're believing for good days. How many are believing with me for some good days, some brighter days? I'm believing that for you, for your house, your family, your home, your health, your finances. In fact, one of the things that the Lord has said to us is that these next five years that we are in currently will be flourishing. And so we're calling them the flourishing five. Anybody believing for a flourishing five? Hallelujah. These next five years, your relationships to flourish and to be healthy, your emotions to flourish and to be healthy, certainly your finances, your spiritual health to flourish and be healthy primarily above all else. But as you flourish there, you just go up in every level, in every way in the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. So the path that the Lord has for us, and we're believing for that. We're believing believers when it comes to that, that area of our life. And so the past few weeks, we've kind of looked at some different ways that we can align our hearts and align our lives so that we can see those brighter days. We've talked about our lifestyle, the way that we live, the steps that we take, the path that we take, living circumspectly before the Lord, that we're honoring God in our lifestyle, with our time, with our purpose purpose, with our effort, with all that we do, right? So we want to do that. But I know sometimes on a Sunday like this, you may hear us for, and I know if it's your first time here, you're like, oh, they're just talking about money the whole time in the service. What's going on? But really, this is attached to your brighter days. This is connected to your brighter days. One of the things I learned a long time ago is that the Lord's not just trying to get something from me. He's trying to get something to me. He's not just trying to take something out of my hand so that I have nothing left. The Lord wants to take what I sow and multiply that and give me more seed to sow and give me bread to eat. Hallelujah. So once you figure that out, once you realize that, once you realize that even for me as a pastor, it's not my job to see how little you can have. Really what I want you to do is to honor God with your life, honor him with your first, with your best, prioritize the kingdom of God and watch him bring all the things you need right beside you. Watch him open up doors that no man can shut. Watch him supply supernaturally in your life to help you to realize that there is a God and it's not your boss, it's not the CEO, of your company, it's not the president, it's, come on, it's, our God is our provider, he is our rewarder, he is the one who supplies in our life, he is the one who is Jehovah Jireh, he is the one who is El Shaddai, he is the one who is more than enough, hallelujah, praise the Lord, so our trust, our confidence is in him, hallelujah, we're not trusting in stuff, we're not trusting in money, we're not living covetously towards things. No, man, God supplies richly all that we need. Hallelujah. Amen. That's the truth. That's the truth. Hallelujah. So in Galatians 6 and verse 7, it says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows. He says, that's what he's going to reap. One translation of this says, don't be under any illusion. You cannot make a fool of God. A man's harvest in life will depend entirely upon what he sows. A man's what? Harvest in life depends entirely upon what he sows. Amen. So us being givers, us being sowers is really what Pastor Aaron Cody was saying. You're casting your bread upon the water and you're going to find it again after many days. What are we doing? We're believing for harvest. Amen. 
Now y'all know we give because we love the Lord. We give because we love the work of the Lord. We give to be obedient to his word, but we also give with expectation. That there's a harvest connected to every seed that we sow. In the book of Genesis it says, as long as the earth remains, there'll be seed, time, and harvest. Seed, time, and harvest. Seed, time, and harvest. Amen. So we sow, and sometimes there's some time in between the harvest, but we keep doing what is good, knowing that there's a harvest of blessing that is connected to the seed that we sow. In verse 9, it says it this way in Galatians 6, in the New Living. It says, so let's not get tired of doing what is good at just the right time. I like the way it says that. At just the right time. Praise God. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Amen. Praise the Lord. And that's what Aaron Cody was saying right there. It's not, it's not every Friday. It's not first and the 15th. You know what I'm saying? But it's also not the lotto either. You know what I mean? It's not like when I went to church and pulled the one arm bandit, put $10 in and Lord bring a hundred by Wednesday. That's not, this, that's not this either. We are trusting the Lord to do what only he can do as we do what really only we can do. There is no harvest on seed you never sow. There's no harvest on seed you don't sow. Do you follow what I mean by that? There's seed, time, and harvest. You know why there's no apple trees most likely in all of your backyards? There have been no apple seeds sown in those backyards. There's no harvest connected. There's no, there's, it's not there. But when we sow, we can have confidence that there is a harvest attached to the seed that we sow. Real quickly, three laws of sowing and reaping. You want to know what they are? Three laws of sowing and reaping. One, you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. Two, you reap after you sow. You reap after you sow. Three, you reap more than you sow. One more time. Three laws of sowing and reaping. You reap what you sow. You reap after you sow. And number three is what? You reap more than you sow. That means it's going to look different when that harvest hits your hand. Amen. So in 2 Corinthians, he says, purpose to be a giver, but just know that if you sow, you, you sow small, you're going to reap small. You sow bountifully, you're going to reap also bountifully. He just says, let everyone purpose in their heart to be a giver. Let everyone purpose in the heart to be a giver. Amen. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you have all sufficiency in all things, that you may have an abundance for every good work. Praise God. Verse 10, I love in this, in this passage, it says, and we've emphasized it, but I love it. It says, now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Increase the fruits of your righteousness. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Last week we read from Matthew chapter 25 uh, where the boss gave a certain amount of, of money really to three of his servants, his stewards, and gave them some time to steward what he gave them. And specifically what he gave them to steward was, it was finances. It was, a, it was an amount of money. And the sooner you realize that you are a steward in this life of what God has placed in your hands, the sooner you realize that, the better you're going to be. You've heard it said, I've said it many times, you've never seen a U-Haul behind a hearse. Just the truth. You've heard about the guy that wanted to take it with him, you know. Took, he put all his special stuff up in, the, up in the attic, you know, his favorite jewelry, his watch, his golf clubs, all his things he really liked, put it up in the attic. Well, he died. His wife went up in the attic. See if he took his stuff with him. He was going to be the first one to take it with him. She went up and looked and his golf clubs are still up there. 
His favorite watch was still up there. All the things were still up there. She said, I guess he should have put it in the basement. <laughs> you may as well honor God with what you have now while you have the chance to do it. Be a good steward over what he has placed in your hands. Hallelujah. I'll read one more passage to you. This is Philippians chapter 4, and then we're going to give, and I'm going to pray for you and pray over you. Philippians 4, verses 15 through 19. Paul says, Now you Philippians know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. He says, Not that I seek the gifts, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all in abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus, that's a person, okay, the things sent from you. A sweet-smelling aroma. Their offering was what? A sweet-smelling aroma. It was an acceptable sacrifice that the Lord was pleased in. That the Lord was pleased in. Did you know that there were times when I, I was a teenager, a college student, that if I put $100 in the offering, It shook me, you know, it shook me. And I could sense, listen to me, the pleasure of God in it. The Lord going, that's good, Aaron. That was your best. That was your best. It was a sweet smelling aroma, a sacrifice that was pleasing to the Lord. Honestly, that's why, especially when I gave younger, you know, that's why I don't think any teenagers in the room are exempt from Heart for the House offering. No teen, no. You got opportunity to steward what you got right now. What a blessing it is. And we got some great givers, great young people giving really generously. Amen. Hallelujah. And it's better to start while you're young than to be 45 and go, oh Lord, 10% sounds like a lot. If you're 17, 18 years old, you're like, I've already been given like that. I'm all past that. Hallelujah. And as the Lord brings increase to your life, you can keep honoring them and keep sowing them. Amen. Well, verse 19, we love. It says, but my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. How many of y'all love that verse of scripture? Oh, man. I love that verse of scripture. But sometimes if you take it out of its context, you don't realize that he's talking to givers. Anybody realize that? And there's a lot of people that that verse don't seem to work very well for, and it's because it's stingy. Get quiet in this holy Presbyterian tabernacle. Stingy. He said, well, there's, there's just not a lot that, that can be done. I mean, the Lord's good. He's a good father. He'll do his best to bless his kids, certainly. We're thankful for that. But Paul said, you've sent aid, you've given once and again. He said, I just want you to know you're not giving yourself into a place of lack. The Lord's going to supply for you. The Lord will supply for you. Amen. And I like that he wrote it to a whole, whole city of believers and Christians. You know what that means? Everyone who's hearing that letter or, or reading that letter, each individual one has different needs at that very moment. And in a place like this, all of you have different needs. You know what I mean? Five years ago, my need would not be need to make sure you pay for your kid's college. Or make a way for them. Now we're in a different place. I got one in college and one on the way. And I'm like, dear Lord. Woo, the Lord shall supply. It's just different. And in five years, it'll be different. There'll be different, different season of life. You know? Some of you got your kids in daycare right now. And I mean, it's costing you everything, you know. That can be challenging. That can be, that can be, that's a season of life that you're in. But the Lord will provide. Somebody said it this way. The Lord makes a way for the giver. You know who I've learned loves messages like this? Givers. People who don't like messages like this, people who don't want to give and don't want to feel like someone's trying to talk them into giving. Well, I'm not trying to talk you into giving. I want you to see the blessing that's connected 
to a generous life. Amen. If you're sitting there going, I've never done that before. What a great opportunity we, we have today, you have today, to honor the Lord. To bring your first and your best to Him. Hallelujah. Amen. And the truth is this, there just are no exemptions. There's no exemptions. You say, well, I make a lot of money. It'd take a, whew, for me to tithe, that'd be a lot to give. You're not exempt. You still need to give. I don't have enough. I don't, it doesn't seem like I have very much. You just look at scripture and you find out time after time, people who had little to nothing, it would be required of them, but it would open up, the do, open up a door for more in their life. Young man with some fish and bread. The, the widow with the son. All oh, she's got one meal left. The prophet asked for it. I mean, you just look at time after time. It's like, what are we going to do? We're going to sow our way out of this. We're going to give our way out of this. Hallelujah. And I really believe this. Your sowing will outperform your saving. And I believe in saving. I believe in investing. I believe in saving, using wisdom. But I'm telling you, you're giving. God can open up doors for you supernaturally through your generosity.